So let's talk about a few strong Necron army lists in current 9th edition 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're talking Necrons, and I thought it might be fun to showcase a few of the top tournament lists that have been having some success recently. Currently I'd describe Necrons as a bit of a middle of the pack army, perhaps suffering from a bit of early codex syndrome, and not quite shaping up with the more recent 9th edition releases, though Games Workshop have certainly thrown them a bone in the balanced data slate, giving a bunch of their units core, so there's some interesting new combos going around with things like Canoptic Wraiths or Scorpec Destroyers. Now those changes have been in effect for a little while, I thought it might be interesting to see a few top tournament lists that make use of them, so in this video we'll go through three fairly different ones, and look at the choices that people have made that have led to them having some success. First up, and one of the most notable big tournament wins for Necrons recently, is this Mephrit and Silent King list, which was run by Seth Piper to take first at the Dicehead Holiday Major. It's quite fun to see a bit of variation in some Mephrit shooting Necrons. The main dynasties do seem to be a little bit overshadowed by the obsec and pregame move combo. The list is made up of a battalion and a Supreme Command attachment, the Supreme Command obviously being the Silent King Zarek, an enormous and threatening centrepiece of the army, firing out a bit of quality anti-tank, and giving some massive re-rolls to anything nearby. To lead the host, there's also a Chronomancer with Entropic Lance and Veil of Darkness, a Technomancer with a Canoptic Cloak and a Voltaic Staff, and a relatively fighty Overlord with the Orb of Eternity, Merciless Tyrant, and Warsythe. The Chronomancer is fairly standard stuff, a nice inval save and re-roll charges to her units, pretty much ideally placed to be jumping around with a big blob of warriors and getting all their guns in range. The Technomancer is certainly a unit that's likely to be seen a lot more of in competitive Necron lists. He's basically functioning as a cop price Space Marine Apothecary now, now that he can heal things like Raves from the Dead, potentially returning quite a lot of points to the board and shortening charge distances and gaining movement. His Canoptic Cloak will be quite good for jumping around the board to keep him where he needs to be, and also means that he can heal the Silent King if needed. The Voltaic Staff certainly doesn't hurt as well on a support piece, a little bit of quality shooting means that you can't just write him off as a buffing piece and nothing more. Finally, that Overlord provides some quality Resurrection Orb action. If you don't manage to fully wipe out one of the Warrior Blobs, or even perhaps the Lich Guard, you could be standing up an awful lot of models back from the dead. He can might well be done yet another unit, and also be a fairly powerful counter charge threat. That Mephrit specific Warlord trait gives him plus one strength and plus one attack. As for the units that they're leading, there's rather a pleasing mix of different types. Five Immortals with Gauss Blasters, good for a little bit of quality fire support or doing things like objectives and actions. A big unit of 20 Warriors with the Gauss Flayers, usually I feel that the Gauss Reapers do tend to supplant them a bit, but perhaps Mephrit is one of the best places to get good value out of them. The extra AP works really quite nicely with being within half range. Talent for Annihilation could give you a few more mortal wounds as and when you need it on a big squad like that and double dipping on the benefits of the Protocol of the Vengeful Stars could also be pretty good for those warriors in a pinch. There is then another blob of 18 warriors with the Gauss Reapers, I guess they're helped out a little bit too with the extra range on their weapons, perhaps the more standard pick where warriors are concerned, and then a couple of really quite meaty melee units, a max squad of 10 Lich Guard with a sword and shield, they work amazingly well with the Silent King, they like the full rerolls to wound in melee, and could work quite well in tag team with him making a unit fight last, and the raids are basically the same, but maybe trading out a bit of durability for being a bit quicker. Finally, there's a big and threatening looking unit of three Locust Heavy Destroyers, three hefty anti-tank shots there, certainly a unit that enemy heavies just really can't ignore. Overall, certainly a progression in Necron list, some interesting uses of some of the new core synergies, and quite a nice balance list with a mix of range and melee to best support the Silent King into battle. Certainly big respect for winning the event, Necrons haven't topped many tournaments in 9th edition lately. Moving on to a completely different themed Necron list, this is Alex Meister's list, who used it to take second at the Bajaburl GT, and is one of the few Necron lists that I've seen that don't use any troops at all. The warriors have been left at home for a mass tide of canoptic nasties. This one is making good use of the relentlessly expansionist and eternal conquerors combo, the custom dynasty rules that give everything obsec and everything a 6 inch pre-game move, pretty nice for getting towards midfield objectives and getting certain units closer to melee if they want to be. The bulk of the list is just a massive rush of Canoptic bodies, there's three massive units of nine Canoptic Scarab Swarms, three units of six Canoptic Wraiths, and between all of those you're going to be putting a crazy amount of obsec wounds on the board. They're both perhaps not the most efficient damage dealers for the cost, 
We can certainly punch up a bit and swarm things that get a bit too gung-ho. With good movement, you could easily dogpile a fair few units into one enemy threat, and they'd certainly struggle to chew through that many bodies. Supporting the Horde and massively upping their damage output are a pair of Technomancers. They both take the Canoptic Control node this time. That's the one that will give all these Canoptic units plus one to hit. I'm sure they'll both be trying to regenerate a Wraith per turn when possible. Over a game, I could easily imagine them stacking up quite a few more wounds back on the board. I guess perhaps one of the trade-offs is that you do give up quite a lot of wounds for no prisoners with these. It looks like it's theoretically possible to max it out, but then you would have to kill almost the entire army, and that's no small matter. It looks like this one's really doing its best to make you lose the primaries. As well as their healing and canoptic control nodes, one takes a failsafe overcharger and has the throw of the Silent King Warlord trait. That's the one that allows you to take the most threatening canoptic unit that you have at that turn and just give it all plus one attack for the ensuing fight phase. Not bad as a Cryptic Arcana piece, though it does cost a fairly hefty 30 points. Lurking within the massed ranks of Canoptet bodies, there's a couple of really nasty threats. Perhaps the most terrifying is the Catan Shard of the Nightbringer. He should guarantee that you can deal with at least one or two enemy threats with his mass mortal wound output, plus ignoring all inbore saves in combat. Hopefully if there's anything just too tough or resilient for the race to grind through, he should be able to help out. There's then a Catacomb Command Barge taking the Orb of Eternity, a Tesla Cannon, the Staff of Light, and the Warlord trait, Enduring Will. I must admit, I'm kind of surprised to see the Orb of Eternity run without big troops, blocks of Warriors, or Lich Guard, but I guess you could gamble big and try and get a Wraith or two back with it. You'd have a fairly high chance if a squad had taken two or more casualties. Enduring Will means that he's pretty tough to take down as well, and could be a threat to throw onto an objective and hold it, even if the rest of his minions die. Finally, for a little bit of fire support, there's a couple of units of Locust Heavy Destroyers, each of those bearing the Gauss Destructor, good for a few really hefty pot shots, and two units of Cryptothrows, very efficient little units for the points, either could stick with the Technomancers and have some fairly hefty melee themselves, or potentially go off and do objectives and actions without committing many resources to having done so. It's quite nice whenever you could obsec your opponent off an objective with units like these. In general though, it's really quite good fun just to see a good Canoptic Harvest of Necrons, and it's fun to see that the course changes have led to a bit of thinking outside of the box. It's really cool that it's so massively powerful on the primaries, but I think it would still take some careful play not just to get gunned down too early and have your opponent outscore you in later turns. Finally, for a third and slightly more balanced list, I thought it might be interesting to look at the highest ranked Necron list at the Leicester City Grand Tournament. Though admittedly, it does seem that it wasn't the best event for the Necrons, this one clocking in at 59th place, though out of a huge field of well over 300. The top ranking Necron list appears to be Richard Burbage's list, again using Relentlessly Expansionist and Eternal Conqueror's combo, but really quite an interesting and multi-threat approach for Necrons, with lots of small units running around. Leading the host, we have an Overlord on a Catacomb Command Barge. He's equipped with a powerful Voltaic Staff, Gauss Cannon, a standard non-relic Resurrection Orb, and the Thrall of the Silent King Warlord trait, which gives you a little bit of a boost to your auras and command abilities. Pretty helpful for getting Relentless March and my Will Be Done, on some more of these widespread threats. We've then got a Chronomancer who's opting for the cheaper Aeon Stave. He again takes the Veil of Darkness to port a unit across the board, and he gains the extra Warlord trait, Implacable Conqueror. That's the one that allows you to re-roll charges. That seems very nice to port one of the squads around the board, perhaps the Warriors, and then at least threaten to have a charge after they've shot their guns, maybe going up a backfield objective and stealing it off your opponent. Finally for the HQ slots, there's a Locust Lord. A fairly fighty and reasonably cheap Lord alternative, and can provide some re-rolls to the destroyers, though maybe not seen quite as often as things like Overlords. In any case, he's certainly decently survivable and fighty in his own right, and he has the Enduring Will trait for that minus one damage again. On to the squads themselves, and as it goes, this is really quite a multiple small unit Necron army. Perhaps the biggest three bricks being a big unit of 20 warriors with the Gauss Reapers, perhaps a good target for jumping around the board and then two very hefty units of Scorpec Destroyers, who I think have become a really interesting unit indeed since they gained core, with more access to stratagems and buffs. There's also a Canoptet Plasma Site as well, which I'm going to guess is to support the Scorpex, though I guess it could support the Ophidians. With big units of six, both of those are just threats that the opponent just can't really ignore, but aren't that easy to focus down either, being able to pop that minus one to wound stratagem when they need to. As well as those though, there's a whole ton of multiple small units running around the table, a unit of five immortals with Tesla, maybe good objective campers or action doers while providing a bit of fire support, four locust heavy destroyers, 
two in individual units and one in a unit of two. Hopefully it should be good for guaranteeing the destruction of at least one enemy vehicle per turn. Two small units of flayed ones, which I'll guess will deep strike. Again, very handy for doing objectives like retrieve Octarius data and maybe going after objectives with their obsec after that. There's then a couple of units of fast movers, a unit of three Ophidian destroyers and a unit of five wraiths. One very tanky, the other quite fragile but fairly hard hitting. A small unit of two Cryptothrals, again usually good value, particularly if there is a Cryptek around. And last but not least, there appears to be a Ghost Arc, which I must admit does slightly confuse me. Other than regenerating more warriors to the squad, and transporting characters potentially, I struggle to see exactly what this one's doing here. I guess if the worst comes to the worst, it's still a really meaty unit with Obsec, and it does kick out a fair amount of Gauss Reaper fire at close range. Overall, a whole ton of threats, a load of good objective scoring units, and it certainly looks like these guys would do well on the primaries and doing well on secondaries too, such as anything with actions, or say engage on all fronts. It looks like a really fun way to play Necrons this, making use from a good variety of units within their codex. So I think we'll leave that there for today. Hope you've enjoyed a small showcase of Necron Army lists in 9th edition, maybe a little bit of food for thought there. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, or I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, with new ones out just about every day. Finally, if you would like to help support the channel, I would just like to mention that the channel has an Element Games affiliate link, and you can find that down in the video description below. Element Games is a good discount retailer within the UK, they usually give 10-20% off Games Workshop's miniatures, and if you were looking to buy anything, there's a link down to them in the video description. If you do buy anything after clicking the link, a small amount goes to help support Auspex Tactics, while not costing you any more whatsoever on the purchase. Can just be a way to help support on things that you were going to order anyway. For people over in the USA, there's also an Amazon link down there as well. Again, that one works much the same. Click the link, order anything at all off Amazon, and a small amount goes to help support the channel. A huge thank you to you guys who have been doing those, it really does make a decent difference. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.